That's the last time I want to be able to do that, so I did it loud. <laughs> <laughs> first, Good thing the end didn't go flying off. Yep. Well, didn't want to hit too hard. Um, first item on the agenda is minutes. So can I have a motion on minutes? Do you have the date for the last meeting? Uh, the 28th. I make a motion to approve the minutes for the May 28th, 2015 meeting. Second. Second, all right. Uh, any corrections, discussions? All in favor? All right. Next item on the agenda is chairman's report. Um, I don't have too much of a report. It's just that I have a few personal comments. Since this is my last meeting, after first being on school committee, uh, 19 years. So I've been been involved with school committee longer than you guys girls have been alive. Um, <laughs> in fact, that's um, always a nice reminder, Bill. That makes it feel really yeah. good. <laughs> so, um, and I know that I have some friends and, and friends of my wife as well. It was, you know, like I said, more than 19 years ago that um, the school was talking about changing the the kindergarten start time, not the start time, sorry, the, the date of when when the kids would start which would affect my older daughter. And there was a one-year position to, you know, uh, that was available uh, because of, of people who had resigned. And my wife suggested to me, why don't you run for it? So if you don't like what I've done, blame her. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, I said I would do it until um, it stopped being fun. And I have to admit that sometimes it wasn't. There, um, I was just recently on vacation and was is checking the, the news and I saw a CNN site about a soldier welcoming uh, uh, the, or coming home on the, his daughter's birthday and saw that it was Green Meadow yeah. and watched the video and those are the great times when the news you know you hear about a news crew being outside of school and those are the great times to hear about. However, there have been some times where a teacher told a young student that she shouldn't pick up her friend because she's so much bigger than her and the friend is so little that she was afraid of hurting and the parent take it the, the wrong way and next thing you know we have the news crew which I think some of you, you know, shaking your heads like remembering those times. And then there's been other times where it's been even a lot worse than something in name as the oh, don't give, don't hug too hard kind of thing. We've had a lot of other things as well so I have to say that sometimes it hasn't been fun. But it's a duty that I felt that being elected to do, we have to go through and do. Um, I might not have made the right decisions, or what some people would say would be the right decision of my whole career, but I felt that I always made decisions that were best for the students and best for the school system. So with that, I sign off and turn over to you, Bob. Okay. Um, so, uh, Bill, you touched on yesterday that Green Meadow was on the local news stations, and today they were on CNN. Oh, wow, that's great. Um, Sergeant Eric Rampley, uh, who had been deployed in Korea since October, returned home early to surprise his daughter during their, her classroom birthday celebration. Um, it was so nice that Mrs. Rampley contacted Ms. McKenzie's teacher, Mrs. McPhail, and asked us to be part of the father-daughter reunion. Really touching. Um, and it's just another great example of you know, why Maine is so wonderful. Uh, our teachers work so closely with our families and our school community, and it's, it's just a wonderful story. So, Bill, I agree. Um, and then last week, I got to attend the CPAC Ice Cream Social, and everybody had a great time. It's always a wonderful event. Also, we had an outstanding award ceremony, and Bill was with me at the MHAS graduation. Mm -hmm. That was a really beautiful day. It turned out to be a perfect day for a graduation and a great event. Um, so, uh, tonight, Bill, you touched on the fact that it's the last school committee meeting for two of our long-standing school committee members. Bill, who served in different capacities for probably over 20 years, because you've also served in other capacities. No, it's actually all was concurrent from the 19. Oh, okay. started started then. All right. In fact, it's 16 years on school committee and three years on the Green Meadow School Council. Yep. Served on the Fowler Building Committee served on the um, charter review twice so uh, a lot going on yeah. a, lot, a lot of it was happening at one time so. but it's all service to the community and amy i think it's been six years in a row seven seven, seven. colleen corrected me earlier yeah because i filled, I filled <laughs> one, one that's of right and pratt's years of so, her term so i'm wrong both times but i'm close <laughs> that's, right. that's it doesn't matter um so uh we, I want to just take a moment. The rest of the school committee 
um, and I have some small tokens of appreciation that we'd like to share. And we're hoping, Bill, that we can either take a brief re recess and enjoy some refreshments, or if we want to just go get some and bring them back. I know that's what we've done in the past. Uh, but how I know I have. How hungry are you, girls? <laughs> oh, I'll let him have a cookie. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's take a why don't we just take a little bit and we'll we and, can grab a. And again, I, we just have a couple of small things. Uh, oh, Mary has a couple you. of things too from the school committee members. Oh, thank you so much. And oh, thank you, Mary. And oh, this yes. is from me oh, and oh, my well, goodness. Um, some lucky bamboo. And when I bought the <laughs> lucky bamboo, I actually um, bought oh. Pauline a, a, a birthday gift that turned oh. out to be very lucky. Oh, isn't that nice? It's so a beautiful wooden container that's so lovely. Yeah, it's a neat stone container. So just oh, a little so something good. to remember us by. Yes, oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. do you want to recess so people can get something? Yeah, why don't we? Okay. Sure. Have a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> Come on over. You don't want to have something after your report then. Oops. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, any snack is a good snack with me. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's so sweet. Read that. Read, this? read what I wrote on the back of that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, <laughs> From, oh, 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 is it really? Yeah. That sounds great. Oh, we didn't have to do that. Thank you so much. Okay, is that ending with your report then, Bob? Oh, that is the end of my report. Okay. So then I'll call on Janelle to give us a student do representative report. Okay. 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 Hi. Um, so it's becoming an exciting and busy time of the year as the school year wraps up. Um, recently, we had an underclassman award ceremony, which was today. Um, <clears throat> we also had, or we're having finals next week and summer work is being passed out and reading lists are being released and um, everyone almost has their schedules finalized and that's pretty much it. Oh, and last, or two weekends ago, I attended a leadership seminar called Hobie at Bentley University. Um, it's for sophomores in high school, and I gained some very valuable experiences through it. Um, one of my classmates also attended another leadership seminar called Mass Star, um, and he, I think, also gained very valuable experiences. And um, with this being my last meeting for the year, I just wanted to thank you all, and I hope I'll see you again next year. So you are coming back as student representative next year? Um, as of right now, I would like to. Okay. Oh, so that's still up there. Yeah. Well, we do have something for you, Janelle. Should I take, take a picture? I don't know. Want to use your iPad? <laughs> so Janelle, can you say a little bit about what you learned at the leadership um, conference? Um, we talked about how to bring back the leadership skills into our community and a lot of people um, put out ideas that they kind of wanted to bring back to their community. We had a lot of speakers. Um, we had this one speaker who really touched me personally. He was a surviving cancer patient and he was nine years old. He had gone down to St. Jude's and um, we ended up making cards welcoming all the St. Jude's patients into the hospital. So when they first go to the hospital, they're gonna receive the cards that we made. And um, nice. there was a lot of good speakers and it made me realize that, um, you know, I really can change our community and make a positive difference. That's great. What a nice experience. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Oh, good. Well, thank you for your service this year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up on the agenda, citizens' comments. So 
going once, twice. All right, next up, our Girl Scout Troop 7. Oh, wait, the wrong number. Turn on the show. Yes, 72595 seven, five, five. Five. Uh, with their silver award presentation. So the floor is yours. Santa, right here. Um, if you want to speak in the microphone so that the camera can pick you up, you can move, Do you want me to move the microphone forward a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe help you out. No problem. I'm sorry. I'm just I, glad you're doing it, not me. You <laughs> <laughs> were just saying that. <laughs> just interrupt you why don't you introduce your each of yourselves first so we get to know you and then you can continue with your presentation all right well i'm caroline i'm sydney i'm lily all right thank you so we drew 72595 are leading our community service project for our sober award <coughs> to, to reach our goal Sand comes up to like right about there. 
So is there like a two kids like kind of sink into the sand? Well, it doesn't have to be sand. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Oh, they are just like. Yeah. It could be dirt or turf. Oh, I thought okay. when I first saw it, I thought the purpose was to have deep sand, but I guess <laughs> you're sort of on. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah, like like sink surface. into like a sand. So it can go on any surface, really, right? Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So where it could it go on pavement even? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So where are you thinking to put it on Fowler? Uh, Can I add a little information? Yeah, sure. These um, wonderful students, uh, I heard they wowed the uh, Board of Selectmen and did a great job there. They were very impressed with you. Um, I met with Andrew uh, uh, Scribner McLean, the Assistant Town Administrator, and he said that the Board of Selectmen have already approved it, but they have to figure out where, um, and that the uh, town's insurance agent has already approved that there wouldn't be any liability issues okay. with having this. One of the concerns that I do have and I asked Principal Meal if he could attend, but he wasn't able to attend tonight. And that is that the new playground that we've, we've got plans for, he's been working with the um, town, the town, the town, the town engineer the and town, facility manager. Yeah, the town facility manager <coughs> and engineer to figure out the location because they got CPC approval, but there were some questions about the location from the CPC. So they're still not sure where it's going to go. Okay. So if you were to approve it tonight, I would, and I, I think it's, an interesting project, I, and I'm a, a big supporter of the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. I have one in each, um, so I know how important this is. I would just make it subject to them meeting with Principal Mila and making sure that there's an appropriate spot on that part of the, uh, of some part of the campus, because uh, I'm not sure he's figured out where the the um, playground's going to be. But I do, since you added that it could be on pavement that's going to make it a little easier because I think that one of the problems we have is that the soccer fields and the playground, that's, we're trying not to encroach on the soccer fields. Right. So if it could be on pavement, that might be easier. Yeah, and then Mr. Merlin had said to us, we started with the first presentation was to tell yeah. that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he definitely said he supported it, he wanted, but he wanted us to, you know, certainly present it to you as well. So, so I would just ask if you approve yeah. it tonight to approve it subject to working with Principal Meal on an appropriate yeah. location. Yeah. Can they be portable? It'd be heavy. Yeah, it'll oh, be heavy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the portable ones are, are often three to four thousand dollars. The ones that we looked at. So it seems like most of the time when they build it at parks or in towns, they are the wooden ones that are put in place. Yes. yes. Okay. And oh, no, go, go. so I, I just want to add to what Bob said about the pavement portion. I mean, I I appreciate the need for space and to think creatively about where it could go. If there's a choice between pavement and grass or something, I, I would. I think everybody would prefer grass, but yeah. also I mean, just running on pavement is actually very bad for developing joints. Um, it, I just say that because it has caused me lifetime <laughs> of knee problems for too much impact as a as a teenage girl from too many sports. So I'm just a little sensitive. I don't like to see kids out there at this age with lots of impact um, and, and not, you know, shoes. The shoes and what you're playing on can make a big difference yeah. too. And, uh, maybe they won't be out there doing it enough, but uh, to the extent that it can be a softer surface that's joint friendly, uh, it's definitely um, beneficial. Some of the soccer pits were built like they put turf in it, yeah, like they grass. Yeah. So that was like one of the ideas we could put as like the bottom. Of the okay. Pit. There so there like a few ideas ago: was pavement, dirt, sand, or grass or fake grass. The turf. Yeah. Yeah. But um, uh, most schools like the fake grass. Because you have to worry about mowing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. they don't like to do the mowing, and it's, uh, they think it's better than pavement, like what you just said. Yeah. yeah. It provides a little bit of cushion. That makes sense. You'll need it when you get older. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be made out of wood. Is it going to be essentially a permanent structure? 
Like yeah. once it gets built, it's going to stay there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One thing that I have as a concern is that we've done a lot of actually more um, like Boy Scout, um, Eagle Scout projects where something gets built and then it doesn't get used the way it was intended and then we're responsible for having to dispose of it. In fact, I think one is still over there, the, the, the ticket booth, or did we actually ever get rid of that? The old one's still there. The we're old building one's a new one. one. Okay. Our tech class is building a new okay. one. Okay. There are certain things that I just concerned. Now, there have been other Silver Award projects um, that have been done for like bleachers by the field hockey fields. That I think actually two different troops have done that because after like 10 years later, they kind of deteriorated and, and whatnot that needed to be replaced. Um, but I'm just thinking, have you given any thought on how this is going to be maintained? Are we going to have Girl Scouts maintaining it, or is this all going to be the responsibility of the school department? Could we answer that? Yeah, I mean, it's. There's two thoughts, in all honesty, though. Size, the new plastic fiber type stuff that lasts longer. Yes. yes. So it's actually, it's actually, it's actually Trash. plastic. It's more plastic than with wood. with some wood filler <laughs> in it. So. Which, which, It's just kind of, I want the girls to think about some of the longer issues instead of just saying, oh, you want to do this and, and have it, and oh, isn't it great? There's, sometimes there's things called unintended consequences that you think of something great, but then you don't think about what's going to happen a few years down the road. And I think that the idea of using the, the track material, the plastic material is, is, is very good because none of you remember a playground that used to exist over at Green Meadow that was all made out of wood that after a number of years, it all just, oh, you do remember it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they would have played on it. Yeah. When you're very little, because <laughs> my daughter, my older daughter was just seven when it was taken down. So, but anyway, it's a thing where the wood just deteriorated where it was no longer safe for kids to play on. And that's also another kind of, granted, there's not a uh, insurance liability, but it's just a thing where you don't want anybody getting hurt on it after a while. But I think that you know, if you plan this well, I think this would be a really great idea. But I just want you to, as you move forward with this, just give it a little bit of thought of how is this going to be like 10 years in the future when, you know, the, the really young, you know, daisies are playing with it when they grow up, you know, be your age. So just give that some thought. So are there further questions? No, just what a great project. Yeah. Thank you. Good idea. Any, yeah. any, any questions from the audience? Not to put anyway on the spot, but yeah. 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 So you, I think you need to vote. To yeah. Vote okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a time warp for you? They <laughs> showed <laughs> a lot of hours this year. They really got planning and the survey and collecting the data and the posters, creating the presentation. They put a lot of work into it. You've, you've done a fabulous job yeah. from from start to finish. Good work all around. Um, I, I hope you see it well, all the way through. We do need a motion on it to vote for to approve it. I Mo okay. Motion to approve the Gaga Pit project. Based on Please. cooperation with Mr. Mila. Sure. And location. Yeah. Okay, so, so first or second? Okay. Yep. Uh, then all in favor? <laughs> all right, girls. Okay. Good luck with it. Yeah, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh. All right, next item on the agenda, the virtual high school VHS private school approval. 
So, so Amy, uh, Amy Michalowski is here. She's the Director of Academic Affairs for Virtual High School. Um, and she's going to do a PowerPoint for us. She did provide us with the proposal in advance. So we have that in, in our packets. And, um, and so uh, looking forward to... Oh, wait, do you want your, uh, Oh, Denise? girls, girls, girl Denise. scouts. Sorry. <laughs> your do, book. You want, don't forget your book. Thank <laughs> you. Sorry. I was going to go by the snack tray again. <laughs> See? And then we're um, continuing to engage in some work with 
American Institutes for Research, who's done a lot of work with us over the past um, 15 years. Um, very briefly, uh, we really want to work with schools and students to give access to programs that they don't have access to. Um, as I said, we stemmed from a problem back in the 90s where students didn't have robust course offerings, the ability to take classes because of limitations of qualified faculty. I'm a former chemistry teacher, and I should probably have framed my experience with VHS a little bit, but I started with VHS as a chemistry teacher. I taught in Westboro back in um, 2002, so I trained as a chemistry teacher, and I was an AP chemistry teacher at the time, and I remember when I was sitting in my AP training at the TAP school down in Connecticut, and sitting next to me was a PE teacher, that this was before HQT was really tightened down back then, um, who was being pushed to teach AP chemistry at his school because he had taken a couple chemistry classes in college and they didn't have another teacher who would do it. So that was kind of the mode back in the late 90s, early 2000s when um, VHS was started. Obviously, now the um, issues of qualified faculty are more due to class size numbers and things like that that prevent schools from offering elective courses to students in um, various disciplines. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of our instructional model and the way that we work with students, I wanted to provide a little bit of detail about um, the academy proposal just so that you have a little bit of a frame of reference. Um, this is a, a project that has come for us out of requests from existing members. Um, member schools that would like to serve students in a slightly different capacity, um, member schools that are interested, they have students that are not well served in a brick and mortar environment. Um, we've been offering a full-time enrollment program um, in partnership with our member schools for the past two academic years. I personally have worked with every full-time student that we've had in our program. Um, it's very small numbers. So while we're a very highly enrolled organization from our you know, supplemental services perspective, and we work with tens of thousands of students a year, um, I worked with eight students last year, and it, my number was between seven and 12 this year. We had a number of students from a private school in Colorado that wanted to all go away for a spring um, mission trip to Nepal. And so their school worked with us to place them in our full-time program for the spring semester while they went and did their mission trip. So my number went up a little bit, um, but Prior to the spring semester, I had seven students that I was working with. So this is a very small part of how we're working with schools and students. Um, for the most part, the students that I've worked with are either on IEP placement, where they can't attend a brick and mortar school for one reason or another. Um, one of my students, extreme anxiety issues, we had professional athletes, we had students that were homeschooled, they wanted to come to a full-time program, their parents weren't able to give them access to a robust curriculum once they had kind of aged past what the, the parents' um, comfort level was with the content that they were teaching. Um, our proposal is very limited in scope for the first few years. Um, we are extremely student-oriented and really customer-focused. Um, our students and our teachers and our schools are our customers. Um, so we're gonna keep the enrollment to at maximum 100 students in the first year. Um, I'll be completely honest, I don't think that we would enroll 100 students. We had seven this past year. Um, I don't think that, we don't have hundreds of people knocking down our door for the service. Um, we do have select pockets of folks that come to us um, that would like to have access to a program. Um, and for them, the diploma would be very important just because it gives them some validity and ability to um, move into college. Um, a few high-level features of the VHS organization, we run on what's called a scheduled asynchronous model. So our courses are paced. Um, they are asynchronous, so students are able to log into their courses at any time of the week, but there's expectations each week for what they have to accomplish. Um, we've been running our courses like that for, as I said, almost 20 years now, um, very successfully. We cap our students, our classes. Um, we work with Susan Loeb, she's a director of instructional technology research at Columbia Teachers College, and she said to me, you know, probably seven or eight years ago now, that our model is one that really closely resembles a very typical classroom environment for kids, and it's very unique in the way that we're able to do that. One of the things that we do is cap student and teacher. So it's a one class, one cohort of students, 25 students to a teacher, and they really are um, forced to engage and interact with each other through um, a variety of collaborative um, exercise and activities each week that I'll kind of walk you through when we go into the instruction model. We do have um, semester and four courses. We have an extremely customer-focused mentality. We are a mission-driven nonprofit, so if you walk through our offices, which are that way, right across the street at the clock tower, um, we, you know, you walk up and down and ask anybody there, and their most important thing are kids. So, you know, site coordinators, students, they call us. I had 
weekly phone calls with each of my full-time students last year. Um, I really got to know them better than some of my students that I taught face-to-face -face when I was teaching because I was really limited in numbers with them. Um, and their parents and families too. So um, we're very accessible. Our technical support um, is very highly rated by our members. We have a lot of the infrastructure needed to really transition into a program that can fully serve students in this way um, because we've been offering online classes um, for so many years. And then um, we try really to build all of our courses around the cohort. So this is not a self-paced, competency-based environment. Students are expected to complete specific activities. A lot of them um, are open-ended, they're writing, they're um, rubric-based grading. And what they do in the online environment, though, and, and you hear, I almost hesitate to put 21st century competencies on there because I feel like it's you know, buzzwordy now in education, and, and it's started to become, um, from my perspective, a pretty empty phrase in circles in, in the online industry as well. Um, but one of the things that I think our students realize as they go through the program is that um, their ability to do some of these <coughs> exercises in an online environment where they have to have a fair measure of responsibility, um, persistence, perseverance, their, communi their communication skills, both written and verbal, really tend to skyrocket because this is the way that they primarily advocate for themselves. So when you throw group work, required participation with other students in the class in, um, they have a pretty well-rounded and robust classroom experience. Um, from the program of studies perspective, we are aligning the program of studies with mass core requirements, so it would very closely align to what students are required to take um, in any public Massachusetts high school. We do have um, 165 different course titles, and we have a couple of content areas in which our offerings are thin, mostly um, foreign language, and we have a content provider partner that we use when students are not able to access. So this year our chemistry course, because I'm a chemistry teacher, I really wasn't comfortable with what we were doing there. So um, we took it offline a couple of years ago and we hadn't had a need to rebuild it um, just because we hadn't had any demand for the course. So um, my full-time students, those five that came in half year, took a half year chemistry offering through a partner and had very good experience with them. So we work closely with them to make sure that students get access to any courses they need. Um, in a uh, academy setting, students would be required, as is the case I think with every private school, to have a full year of attendance before um, being granted a diploma. And then um, we would look at adding a number of student indicators to our longitudinal data set that we collect institutionally. So we have a um, set of key quality benchmark indicators, key program indicators that we've collected since 2001. Um, enrollment data, student success data, course um, completion rates, course pass rates, AP scores, and we keep those and they're reported up to the board of directors annually. They're also used internally for strategic planning and goal setting um, within the institution. So we would add specific um, student outcomes related to the full-time program to our QBI mix so that we're able to track program efficacy and um, student success. Um, two more little bits about the academy, and then I could stop and answer questions or I could go right into kind of what our instructional model is like. Um, I've realized, having worked with full-time students over the last couple of years, um, so it's been great to be able to test out a little bit um, with the support of their homeschool, um, some of the specific supports that a fully online student would need. So um, we have a really good, I have a really good sense of what um, students in a full online environment are gonna need to be successful. And we're um, well positioned and ready to put all of those supports in place. Um, starting with the learning coach and the VHS coordinator, I have, very close relationships with the parents of my full-time students because I spoke with them regularly as well. Um, we have already begun contract discussions with some on-time, um, on-demand tutoring services and intend to provide, at least um, at the beginning while the program is small, any of the wraparound services for special ed or um, guidance through contracted partnerships with um, licensed folks within the state. So we have um, a number of schools, as I said, we work with over 200 schools in the state so we have um, guidance counselors that are already very familiar with the VHS program that um, are willing to contract with us to do um, required attendance sessions with students. So our model would be that the students would um, be required to um, engage with their guidance counselor in group sessions and individually and um, multiple times each year. So that there would be in time person-to-person um, -person communication and there would be a personal connection for every student to multiple people at the organization. Um, and as I said before, um, Technical support is something that I really have no concern with in terms of providing students with um, support that they need. Um, one of the things that often gets asked in full-time online environments is how students interact with each 
each other. Um, so, you know, for the most part, in our supplemental services, we don't have to worry so much about student-to-student -student engagement because they're in the brick and mortar schools or they're homeschooled students and they have lots of activities. Um, I think that that's actually going to maintain, be the case and be maintained for most of our full-time students. Um, the students that I've worked with in the past couple of years have had very robust opportunities in their local environments to interact with other students. So, um, but we plan to put in um, a number of, and we've built out um, a variety of offerings. As it's going to depend upon what our student mix is like in the first couple of years um, to decide how regularly and um, how many of these are required. But our curriculum and instruction team has brainstormed um, some synchronous activities where we can allow students various platforms to engage with each other in educational settings, but not content specific and not graded environments. So we're looking at holding um, open house sessions every month with various members of the VHS staff or with um, just, you know, kind of supervised um, chat sessions with students where they can get in and do things with each other. My son has a magic club that he does after school every week with his um, friends. He's in eighth grade. So, you know, allowing kids to have access to, um, we have a folk, some folks from our technical team that are looking at how students can engage with each other, even in different game-based scenarios within the same environment online. We're talking about doing um, different performance showcases, so open mics, we have a lot of writing courses where students write different pieces, um, a science fair where they can show off some of their science work that they've done, um, participation in our academic advisory board. We actually love student participation, I chair our AAB. Um, and that's something where students would have a really unique lens <coughs> to how um, the model is working for them and give a, a good perspective to the folks on the board as well. And then um, because we're located here, which is fairly central in the state, and we have, um, most of our full-time students are actually not in Massachusetts right now, um, but we would actually offer multiple opportunities for students to come to our VHS office. So we have um, large conference space available within our office, and then we have access to the theater that's up there. Um, we're actually right down the hall from that Ken Olson Auditorium, I think is the name of it, um, right up there. So we've housed conferences um, there in the past. Uh, we hosted a legislative session. We've done um, some things in the independent schools. We've done some PD up there. So having kids come in and have access to each other in that environment as well is something that we've been putting um, together. And this is in addition to the kind of forced fun in our regular class model, um, which is really collaborative, you know, due to the nature of how we set up the activity. A couple more things, I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, when we start to look a little bit at the VHS model, so um, we're all about cohort-based online learning, as I've alluded to a couple of times. Um, and what that looks like in our courses, as I said, fixed class numbers, um, lots of opportunities for students to get um, involved with each other. We have required group work um, in every VHS class. Each class has required online discussions each week. The rubric-based, the graded, we expect certain amounts of participation. Um, and we train our teachers when they go through our teacher training protocol and how to engage students and build community in their online classes. Um, it's something that we are very, very proud of as an organization because it's something that's pretty unique in the online space. Um, we track, we are a real survey-centric organization as well, so we get um, an enormous amount of feedback from students. So we've driven our student response rate to our student surveys up to, I want to say over 70% 70, 70 or so, which equates to probably about 10,000 student responses a year. Um, and we dig really deeply into student feedback. So we'll use that to key in on classes where activities may not be going the way that we want them to, where courses need revision, where teachers aren't working um, or performing up to our standard. But it also um, feels really good. We have lots of open-ended questions in the survey, which they're, so the surveys are psychometrically designed through the research partner. So we have you know, some measure of validity across the questions that are asked. And when we were first putting them together, they said, you can't do open-ended, you can't do open-ended, because you can't analyze results. But those kind of have been added on as tagalongs to the you know, structured Likert scale type responses. And it's amazing to me to see um, the feedback that you get from kids, positive and negative. So it's not, you know, these are anonymous surveys. They're not linked to student grades. The teachers don't know that they pass them in. Um, they just come directly to VHS. And to see the depth of um, community and the amount of interaction that is really meaningful for students in our model, is, it just makes me really proud to be part of the organization. 
Um, we do enroll students from across the country and around the world, so we have um, a few dozen countries here and there um, at any one point in time. We have a really great collaboration. Most of our international schools are not indigenous, they're mostly um, American international schools, but that still gives kids a really great perspective when you're asking them to talk about things in class. So we have um, you know, questions about uh, bioethics, we have ethical questions or debates or environmental questions or government things or current events, and when you're bringing in perspectives, you know, I did a lot of talk on global perspectives a few years ago, and it was, you know, big G global, you've got lots of different countries, but even little G global, you've got communities that are fairly insulated. I taught in Westboro. My Westboro kids, they really didn't go to Worcester that much. They went to Boston maybe to go to the theater, but they didn't really have a very good perspective about even what, within the United States, um, regionally different lives were like. So because we serve students from really a cross-section of the United States, um, kids get a really good perspective on what life is like in different um, corners of the country. And then um, we're very purposeful about how we build and foster community in our classes. Um, required icebreakers, very purposeful course design where um, we have activities. We've, we've done the trial and error perspective on how this works. Um, so our courses aren't flashy, they're not self-paced, they're not, I apologize, Sorry, I wish I could just make it soft. <laughs> okay. I hydrated it, but I still muted. I apologize. Um, so we did lots of trial and error in the beginning. So we had, you know, the late 90s to figure out you can't expect kids to come in. I mean, group work stinks in a brick and mortar environment for kids, right? But you can make it work in an online environment if you're purposeful about introducing kids to concepts and pushing them to build a little bit of um, a network within their group. And finding ways to space it so that they have time to interact with each other. So um, we've really worked hard to set a lot of examples throughout our courses. Um, we have exemplars, we have required icebreaker activities, as I said. Um, and our training for our teachers is very purposeful in that um, we try to really put them in the shoes of students so that they really experience what it's like for kids in their classes. And it gives them a really unique lens into what um, their students are gonna experience. A couple of really quick design elements, as I said. Um, our courses are very organized. They go with the INA um, online quality course design standards. Um, we have brief bits of content that students are able to kind of digest. One assignment per activity. Um, there's lots of stuff that goes into, I think, quality course design um, that we've really refined over the past um, 15 years. So we have an internal publishing plan. Our courses are systematically reviewed and improved. Um, we work with our content teachers to make sure that the course improvements are, our courses were designed in most part um, by classroom teachers. So they're teachers that are intimately familiar with the content. And um, our subject matter experts work with our curriculum coordinators to make those um, subjects come alive in the online environment. It's funny, when we first started, anybody with a great idea, like I would, of course, I'm not an online designer. Um, it was a basic chemistry course. It really probably now, looking back, it was great back in 1997 or 1999. It's not that good now. <laughs> um, great teachers aren't necessarily great course developers, and we found that out over time. So our development uh, model has shifted to really leverage what's the strength of the teacher, which is the unique idea, that thing that they've done for 10 years in their classroom that works really well for kids and gets them all jazzed, and help them bring it to life with the right tool or the right resource, uh, the right instruction sets and things like that. In the, um, we do try to do a lot with a variety of modalities for students. It's, there is a lot of text in any online course, um, but we provide students with access to lots of video, audio, PowerPoints, um, podcasts. There's a lot of tutorials and things that they do. Um, our courses are pretty engaging for students. Uh, we like to use OER, Open Ed Resources, for the most part in our courses. Um, and uh, we've built in uh, really robust lab kits for all of our science courses now as well. So students. Um, before had done a lot of work hands-on just with materials they could find in their house um, and now any of the students in our core and AP science courses get a lab kit that um, they, they are able to use. Uh, lots of assessment strategies. I think I've kind of gone through a lot of this as we've talked before. Um, lots of opportunities for students. This is not objective assessment after objective assessment in a course. They write, they create, they talk with each other, they peer review, they peer edit, they have debates, they have group work. Um, there are lots of rubrics in every course that are standardized from course to course. Um, and aside from our core and AP courses, there's actually very minimal use of objective um, true-false multiple choice questions. 
um, except in case of kind of formative assessment during the course of the week. So in a math class, we might provide students with a lot of little quick tips so they can get, um, you know, where am I with the skill or this content that I'm learning? Um, but that's not the sum of what they're expected to show or where they're going to be graded for their work. Um, in our courses, we do use the I may call um, National Standard for Quality Online Courses, a VHS. If you look back to our initial virtual high school course standards back from the late 90s, um, they are cousins of the INACOL standard. Our former CEO, um, Liz Pape, was very um, intimately involved in the INACOL standards development because VHS is a, um, has been around and has done really good work with courses. So we've stuck with the INACOL standard as kind of the industry standard for courses. Um, our core courses. Um, half of them have been aligned so far by a third-party correlation service to, um, they're actually aligned um, into a metadata um, system so that we can actually pull out a correlation to any of the state standards, um, but they are um, well aligned, over 90% alignment to all of the mass <coughs> frameworks um, and common core frameworks for the courses that have been done to date. The remaining bucket of our core courses will be aligned to this academic year. Um, and we already are, um, further ahead with NGSS, that's the Next Generation Science Standards, um, than a lot of brick and mortar schools are because of the nature of how um, our students have thought about science in our courses and the types of um, exposure they've had through different content strands. Um, so the rest of what I was going to talk to you about, um, you know, Bob said maybe 20, 30 minutes, so I don't want to go too much further. I have a little bit about our faculty qualifications, our training protocol, um, our mentoring evaluation system. I'm happy to go through that with you if it's relevant or important. Um, I'm also happy to stop here and take questions or just have a conversation about the proposal or things that may have come up. Yeah, I, I, I have a couple questions and I'm assuming the rest of the committee does as well. Um, I'm, I'm looking at your proposal here mm -hmm. and saying about the graduation requirements and you say um, that you're expecting to complete at least 24 credits mm -hmm. to graduate. Yeah. But that's not the total number that normally, you know, listing here for what the Massachusetts recommends for the different subject areas. So this table, the table that's on page, here five. on page five, yeah, is the Mass Core requirement. Okay. So that's actually, I think a total. It might even be a total of twenty-two credits. Oh, it is. Oh, okay, it is. Um, okay. And so we are expecting students will complete twenty-four credits. Um, and that's something that I think is fairly standard amongst high schools. I know that the NAS Core is the minimum expectation. Okay. Right. Um, and okay. it doesn't count things like, NAS Core doesn't count PE every year, um, which most students have accumulate more than just one credit of PE over a four year high school experience. Um, so that's definitely, our, line, our expectation is that students will take six credits of courses each year okay. in order to receive their diploma. All right. Uh, I have to say, my, my daughter uh, has just graduated from mm -hmm. Inter High and has taken some virtual courses mm -hmm. uh, from it, and um, so I, I understand the mechanism mm -hmm. with it. But some of the things I could mention that you were talking about, like a chemistry course, and I'm thinking like physics and biology mm -hmm. that usually have a laboratory mm -hmm. part of it. How do you manage that? Because I know like in, in physics, because you had that, there's some... Not right. not super specialized, but still specialized well, yeah, so equipment. Actually, no, that's a great question, and I alluded to it a little bit, and I'm happy to, I love talking about science. So, mm -hmm. um, so we actually this year have, um, so a little bit of background. We have never offered biology, chemistry, mm -hmm. and physics before. Uh, we've offered, our science catalog is, I think there are probably between 30 and 35 different course titles that are mostly elective courses. Um, and all of those had a variety of hands-on activities. So in anatomy and physiology, they made joint models, they dissected chicken things, they you know, go out and explore their environment, they do different things. Um, and some of our teachers in schools in the past have actually mailed, when I taught my chemistry course, it was a not intended to be chemistry one, it was actually basic chemistry. Okay. So it was mostly used for kids as a, an elective enrichment course before they okay. took. So a little bit of exposure or some remediation for kids before they jumped full scale into a chemistry class. Um, so my school, in support of my course, would actually, I would collect um, boxes of materials and I would ship them out to the kids and they would do pH activities and okay. point models and stuff like that. Um, Non-sustainable model. And so this past year, what we've done is we've engaged with two different companies. So um, eScience Labs for our AP Biology course um, specifically, and then 
Um, we actually moved away from them for the rest of our courses, um, and we work with Aqua Phoenix Company. So Aqua Phoenix has allowed us to create a customized lab program, and students receive um, a lab kit that has, they are about $175 to $300 kits. So for the physics course, they get ramps, and okay. they get sensors, and that gets shipped to their house. Um, they actually don't ever have to be shipped back. A lot of our students just leave them with their school because the return shipping and the restocking and the remanagement of the materials Fixing parts makes things way that, yeah. more expensive to, to sustain. Um, for chemistry, they get a full micro-scale lab kit that allows them to do um, the prescribed number of expected AP lab experiments, but also includes some experience. So the AP science program now is a lot about inquiry and student-directed and student-created um, um, experiments. So it actually includes a, a number of different chemical sets, too, that students can use to design their own experiments. So we have um, in place for this year, we have all of the AP programs have their own lab kits. And we're working with Aqua Phoenix for the support of the kits for the fall courses in biology and chemistry. We don't, um, we don't have a full year physics course right now. So if an 11th grade student were to enroll in the academy and they needed physics, we would use our partner provider that already has a lab kit that um, so that's something that we recognize needed to be fixed as we were looking at, you know, increasing how robust our AP program was and allowing students to be more successful with that track of courses, but also to complete, you know, the required hands-on stuff. Yeah. Um, Can I just ask who yeah. the partner provider is or provider? Uh, so right now for our core courses that we can't serve, we use Connections Learning. Okay. Um, Okay. I'm, familiar them, with, yeah, I'm familiar with Pearson and Edgenuity and other yeah, companies. Yeah, so we, we don't use, um, we were more looking for a content provider, not a publisher. Okay. So Pearson and the other companies, there are more publishers that have content. Um, Connection, you know, they run full-time virtual schools. The Connections runs the Tech Academy down in Dedham. Uh, K-12 runs. Those are kind of the two biggest um, players in the, the charter school business. Um, the Connections model is a lot more similar to ours, and um, so we can support their courses for students if they build our own. Amy, with regards to the labs, when they're doing the lab experiments, are mm -hmm. they doing those as part of group work, or is it an individual lab where they're well, doing it in their own? So usually speaking, what they've done is they've done the work at home, and then we use a variety of collaborative tools for students to share. So if, I don't have internet on my computer, but if I took you into our AP chemistry course or the physics courses, you would see the students do, so they show the teacher that they've done the work by posting pictures of their work along the way or videoing their work and putting that into a Dropbox where they've shown that they've demonstrated they completed. But then they share class data in wiki areas so that they can do some um, error analysis, some qualitative and quantitative analysis of how the lab went, and then they have required lab discussions. So it's very similar actually to my classroom model for managing a lab. We have a lab activity, we do the lab work, um, students work in groups to do that, they share class data, and then they do their own analysis and interpretation of it. Um, so it's fairly similar to that model, but they do some of the work um, alone, some of the work. A lot of times, so a couple of my full-time students, their parents helped them with the labs. Um, it's very frustrating for kids to do labs that aren't used to, you know, you come into a 55-minute class and your teacher's got 50% that's set up for you and you have to like, you do stuff, but you're working in a model, this is a lot more exploratory for kids, so it's a little bit of a, a challenge for them to get the hang of, um, but it's a lot more open-ended as well. And di questions? dissection, do they, are they dissecting we in their have, homes? I'm just trying to imagine what this looks no, like. No, so <laughs> Fetal we pig. do have an anatomy, um, we have an anatomy elective course mm -hmm. that they do chicken dissection, um, and they do some, um, they use a program called ImageJ, so it uses, um, uh, online microscopic analysis of different kinds of yeah. slides. Um, they don't get like a cat or a frog or okay. anything like that. They do virtual dissections, um, yeah. but they don't. And that's not, we don't count that as a core course for science anyhow, and it's an elective course. So they do do some dissection of their own. They build some things, um, models of joints, they do different stuff like that, but they don't have like a baby pig that's shipped to them. That we had. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. How do you handle virtual physical education? So we actually have a PE course. So I think um, realistically, so in my uh, research on online, fully online academies, and even private schools to some degree, um, I think realistically how it's gonna play out for most students is
is that they will meet their physical education requirement through participation in a school sport or, you know, we have students that the reason they need an online course is because they're like premier level athletes. So PE from a health and fitness perspective is not necessarily um, required for maintenance over four years. Um, we have a physical education um, semester course that students take. So they actually receive uh, heart monitors, they do PE tests, they have um, required, their parents are required to part, well, a, an adult supervisor is required to sign that they've completed all the activities. They do personal fitness assessments along the way and they discuss health, and nutrition, diet. Um, they do a little bit of social emotional stuff in there. Um, and we also have a health course, Perspectives in Health, that does more of the traditional health, um, you know, body, diet, um, psychological things of, you know, adolescents and so. So they do actually have, there's actually a whole company now that talks about these guys with own PE, they just do online physical education. So they use a lot of video stuff to show kids how to do weights and different exercises. But um, as I said, we have a course, we're developing um, a second for next, not this coming academic year, the next one. Um, but I anticipate that a lot of the students will be taking PE through an alternative um, source. Okay. Because um, I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around, because I mean, I understand your uh, mission as sort of providing, like what you do with Maynard right mm -hmm. now, as providing the, like my, my daughter took oceanography, mm -hmm. and that's something that we you would never be able to, to, to offer. Um, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around full-time student, you know, virtual high school mm -hmm. um, aspect of it, and trying to fit that into the basic requirements. The other, the other thing, a question that I, I don't see addressed here, is um, for a full-time student, mm -hmm. in, in you, you know, once, once it gets off the ground, um, since you are a private school, mm -hmm. How much is the tuition, or how so, is that handled? So I'll, I'll answer both your questions. So I think, um, so I think part of, so I've worked in online ed now for 12, 13 years, right? Part time when I was teaching, and I've been with VHS since 2006. Um, I'm not an advocate of full time online school for every mm -hmm. kid. I'm not. VHS chose not to pursue a charter school. We don't want to compete with public schools for students that are happily engaged in their public school and really successful and you know, thriving in their environment. I will say that my eyes have opened over the past few years to the fact that there is a population of students for whom, and, and for, for our model, it's not actually um, overage students or you know, students that are very behind academically that need to be remediated. There are different um, strategies and schools that approach all of that. For us, it's largely the folks that have come to us with interest are homeschool students. Um, students that are non-traditional, for one, I had a student who had a baby and she didn't want to go back to her school. There was a lot of peer pressure and joking and things like that. Um, I have students that have extreme anxiety disorders and they can't get themselves out of their door to go to their school. Um, we have students that are um, required, they need to work during the day to support their family so they can take courses with us to kind of maintain a path. So I, I say non-traditional in a, um, in a way that's very positive about the fact that you can impact kids. So I think... Actually, um, actually there's one category that you kind of miss, which is what I kind of almost went to immediately. Um, students with health reasons, like a, a compromised immune system where they can't be in sure. the general population we as did, well, we whether it's for was, cancer. Um, or, off of a multiple organ transplant yeah. this past year who took classes. He actually took a very short course of courses with us um, just while he was hospitalized because he was itching to get back to his brick and mortar environment, but he had to be quarantined for some length of time. Mm -hmm. So that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, um, I don't know that every student will achieve a diploma in a four year straight course. So if we took a ninth grader in, I think because of the population of students that you're serving, I think that there is a very likely chance that some students would take more than um, four years to achieve a diploma because there's a reason that they're not thriving in a brick and mortar setting. And, um, but I think for some students, you know, we had a student that just wanted to be at home. The parents homeschooled, the mother was very frank at saying she couldn't teach high level calculus, high level math and science. And she said, we can do book work, we can go to libraries, we can go to you know, museums, we can do all this, but he wants to go to a technical college and I need to be able to give him access to these kinds of courses. So I think that there's a lot of different fits. So part of it, um, for me, coming to really supporting the initiative 
was really understanding that we're not doing this for every kid. That's why our numbers are small. We're not recruiting. You're not going to see a VHS Online Academy little ad. They make me crazy when I see them. You know, Keystone Academy. I mean, you know, Apex and Keystone and all of the for-profit providers that are um, added for different reasons. You know, so that's to answer your first question. In terms of tuition, we're working that out because what we found over the last couple of years, so we have a tuition rate set from our last two years of our full-time program, which was $4,000 um, a year for a full load of courses. Um, for the additional services, that didn't pay for my time to work with all those kids. So it's going to be um, north of that. I've done a little bit of industry analysis. It's the, the spread is huge, I'd say from 5500 to twelve dollars or $15,000 at different online private academies. Um, so we don't have a number yet. Um, our CEO could give you a number if that's a requirement for um, passing a proposal, but I would say that it would be between um, where we were at, which is 4000 and I would say no higher than the state reimbursement for like a you know charter school tuition is about, well, they're, they're reimbursing the public charter on the academies at, I think, $6,700 a year. I would say that we would be you know, more than that range, maybe $7,000 at the most, um, but we would be somewhere in that range. On-demand tutoring, IEP services, the guidance stuff, that's all um, additional infrastructure support that, you know, when we partner with the school to work with kids in a full-time capacity now, they're receiving a lot of service from their home school. So I was the student's guidance counselor, but I also had access to their guidance counselor and the SPED department at their school for support as needed. And when we're taking all that on, that's going to be an additional cost. Could so. we say a little bit more about how you plan on meeting the needs of um, kids on IEPs or 504s? So we've, we've worked with students on IEPs and 504s pretty successfully. Um, we track some, so there's just a few things. Um, we track our student success. Our students with IEPs and 504s are slightly less successful than our general population of students, but still um, very successful overall. So I want to say, um, and I can provide the specific number, but I want to say that our general pass rate, which our completion rate, and we're refining the way that we speak to our metrics a little bit because our completion rate organizationally has always kind of dropped some failures in one bucket. And I think that um, it does a disservice to the quality of the program a little bit to talk about those in the same breath. Um, we run about a 10% drop rate and about a 10% failure rate for a combined about 80% course completion rate. And that number has varied a little bit from I'd say 78 to 84% over the past 13 years, but it's very consistent. Um, our completion rate for our students on IEPs is about in the mid 70s. So it, I would say it ranges between 70 and 75 percent um, on an annual basis year over year. Um, we do a lot with kids. So in our membership, the way that we've worked with students on IEPs is that we work very closely with their, their local school. So our teachers are real teachers. They're used to making accommodations for kids. So a lot of the typical accommodations that are required in a brick and mortar setting become a little bit obsolete in any so they don't need extra time on assessment. Sometimes they do, and we're happy if we provide extra time. We provide, you know, um, synchronous contact with the teachers. We have check-ins. We have um, breaking down assignments in different ways. They provide tutoring support. Sometimes it's materials. Um, we worked with the School for the Blind, so that was a lot more about the JAWS and the screen reading capabilities um, than it was about any of the academic support. So what I've done this year with my students is I found that we need testing services, which is an identified kind of cost that we've built into the program. So when I think to do due diligence to any student that's in a um, full-time academy, we really have to be the ones that are working with a testing service and establishing the IEP that's going to work for them. So part of it is going to be through a really careful admission screening. I'm not discriminatory in any way, but just realistic about what students' aptitudes are, what their learning styles are like and how much support they have at home, how self-directed they are, how communicative they are, what their writing skills are like, what their reading skills are like. Certain things are easier to support. I can support reading skills. There's actually a lot of tools out there now that will provide you with um, websites that are read in um, different reading levels. So we have read speaker in our courses to give kids an audio break if their eyes, you know, if they're not, you know, true into reading. Um, but I think that the, the types of accommodations really come from very close work with so 
and, and it's been, I mean, we have some um, substantially disabled kids. We work with the Deborah Glennon School. Um, they do a lot of the site-based support internally. Um, those students are all high-risk, um, challenged students. There's a school in Rutland and a school in Connecticut that we work with. Um, their students have been very successful because we've been really close partners with them. Um, I think that the, the other key part is um, the communication and the openness between the teacher, myself in the past as the learning coach, but any learning coach or um, DHS staff member that we have assigned to students, and the parents as well. Because I think that in any, um, in any online education relationship, you have, there's a triad of support, so to speak, where you can't, I as a DHS staff member can support my students um, so far. Call her every week, I can give her organizational skills, I can you know, help her strategize her work, I can keep her on track, I can do that. Her teacher is really important to me and to her, but her parents is that third leg or that you know, site-based support. It may be a grandparent or a you know, trusted family friend, but it really is a, a very personal thing for, our, for all the kids that we work with. But, but your plan as you um, transition into accepting the full-time students is, because you've mentioned a number of times of working with the local school district, mm -hmm. Um, for kids who, who have special issues. Yeah. But as you um, transition to accepting the full-time students, yeah. it sounds like you're planning on building all of that um, special education infrastructure, uh, expertise and diagnosis within um, your own system. Yeah, so I think at the beginning, while we're building um, enrollment, it's not cost-effective for us to hire special education staff off yeah. of that, which is why we're looking at um, our CEO and myself, we're on um, the Virtual School Leadership Alliance. It's a collection of state virtual schools. And they have, they serve full-time students, and they have um, a number of recommendations for special education providers that we can yeah. work with in an online class. So you do more of a contracting relationship yeah, than, rather think, than a full-time? Well, initially. And yeah. I think as our enrollment grows, then we will certainly bring that expertise in-house. Um, but for right now, you know, we had, what did I say, eight students Year. Right, and so it doesn't make sense to hire. So, yeah. yeah, there's not really a need for that. Um, but it's just like if you have plans, though, to provide for that when it's necessary oh, on a case sure. by case basis. Yeah, and we yep. have a track record of having done that very successfully. Okay. Um, and that's the same thing with guidance services. You know, as our enrollment grows, we will certainly have a need to hire a head of guidance and a guidance counselor for the program. Um, but for right now, you know, until I think we have, you know, the guidance load of most schools is a few hundred students. And we would never go that high because it's a lot of time um, not having the face-to-face -face ability to say, Bobby, first period, my desk, you know. Um, it takes, there's a lot of management and setting up. Um, but I would say that until we have probably 100 students, we will have contracted guidance services yeah. with guidance counselors from around the state that will do, you know, what somebody in-house would do. And we've been doing that as well with, uh, um, when we have individual students that come into the program, um, they come and we have a site coordinator that works with them. That's a VHS staff position now that you know works with the students that you know just want to enroll from because they can't get the course at their school and their schools on the first. I have one more question about the graduation sure. requirements. One of the things that we have is a we actually have a, a very unique three tiered capstone requirement. But mm -hmm. do you offer any kind of capstone requirements? You know we've talked about them? that a lot internally, um, and we don't have a great concept for. I think that that might be something that we could add to the program as it grows. Um, right now, we, we've been doing um, a lot of work with trying to identify some programs of studies for kids that would lead to a certificate or some sort of a, a demonstration of mastery in specific fields. So we have a you know, biotechnology program of studies and a computer science kind of program of studies. And I think that that ultimately um, could so one piece of advice, though, is that, uh, like I said, ours is actually very unique mm -hmm. in that we have a three-tiered one. Yeah. Most people don't. I'm very familiar with them. We've been, I've been doing them for years. In other yeah. districts, senior projects is obviously one of the bigger ones yeah. around. But digital portfolios, I would assume, would be really uh, yeah. a, a, a way that you could probably do that. Well, in our learning management system, that's something that's already happening in the learning management so. system. It's an accumulation of work and portfolio piece. Um, we are more thinking for capstone work identifying a contest strand of interest and looking at some right. sort of an like internship. Senior project. Or, yeah, that's what we yeah. do. Yeah, and that's, it's hard to, we have a community service uh, course, it's called Service Learning, where students are able to go out and complete a um, community service project. And we've 
contemplated adding that as one of the required elective courses for any student that wants to have a diploma, but we just haven't 100% committed to that as a graduation requirement. So the content exists to some degree, but it's hard for kids to manage that. Um, this is a question for Bob. Has anyone within our system observed these classes in action? We have, well, we, we've been partnering with VHS for 10 years or so, maybe a, a little time. more. And we've had two or three different teachers who have done it over the years. Currently, our math um, department chair, Sandy LeBlanc, is one of their teachers. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, um, we have 50, mm -hmm. poor, poor, basically 50 courses. Our students annually take about 50 courses through them. Um, uh, and like Bill said, his daughter took one because yeah. we have educators who are our partners with them. Are they 50, are, are you saying 50 different courses? Are 50 there 50 courses. students who might, some of them be taking the same course? Uh, oh. it's, it's 50. It varies. So okay. we did yeah. a little count. So we have since the first year student enrollment since yeah. 2000, Maynard has had almost 500 students enrolled in the VHS program and they've used 140 different courses with a uh, completion success rate of 85% over their life. And as I said, that's a combined drop in failure rate. Mm -hmm. um, that was on our old kind of system. We have the good thing about being a really data-centric organization is that's just coming from our registrar. We have, we have enrollment data from 2001. So we are going to be reworking the numbers to look at it um, in terms of number of students that drop because there are some kids who they get a little bit into it and it's just not for them. And in a one-off, you know, it's one class they take, they'd rather just be done and that's okay. And we work with the school and the school plays in a different course at their school or in a study, whatever there. Some schools don't allow them out um, and then so our failure rate is actually probably a little bit higher than it um, would have been if you considered all students that are actively engaged in the course. Because we do have some schools that have really strict drop, rate, um, drop rules and kids are forced to complete um, even if they never show up. Or not complete. So. <laughs> right. Other questions or concerns? Things that you feel like are not answered or? So lo logistically what happens <clears throat> if so Virtual high school gets approved as a full school, it's not right? An yeah. As a, yeah. As a private and, school. And say we have 10 students who suddenly say, we want to do everything online. How does the district <clears throat> handle that then? Is it an automatic, if we approve it, can then any kid who wants to go there? Well, as a private, it would be like if our kids wanted to go to Imago, which is a private okay. school, brick and mortar private school, the parents would be paying for it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, you know, only if you have it's kids not a that charter. go to yeah. an online school full time, they've probably already gone. They're at Tekka or they're at Mama because yeah. those are free. They're charter schools. The, the only thing so, way it would hurt us would be yeah. is that we'd be losing the money that we'd have by having a Maynard student go to Maynard school. Right. So we would lose five k from the state, but it's Correct. not going any yeah. other That's place. It's just it's just taking right. out of yeah. taking it out of the system. But as a private school, it's not like they're going to a charter school where it would be, it would come off yeah. the cherry sheet on the town. They would, the parents would be paying the private school. Yeah, right. So when they go to the uh, virtual charter school, is that what happens? The charter school gets the state It's like money. any other charter school. Okay. Yeah. They get okay. the state aid for the student. There are two in the state now. I mean, there's not. And so the two in the state, they're only serving students within Massachusetts. You're looking, your students are farther afield? Yeah, the two, the state charter schools are, they're limited in enrollment and they're limited to Massachusetts. Although they actually can engage with um, with schools in supplemental arrangements, and I believe that there's not a restriction geographically on that, um, we would look to engage with students from wherever there's interest. I spoke with a parent about our full-time program, our non-diploma granting, because um, as I said, we've worked with students. She's in Missouri, and they have they've homeschooled, and the, you know the rules are really loose out there, and the mother doesn't know what to do with her, and she didn't progress last year, so they want a rigid environment, but they won't put her back in public school. So we get calls um, from across the country. As I said, it's a it's a very small program, and it, it would continue in our estimation to be a really small part of our program. Um, it's more a tool in the tool belt for particular kids for whom it's a really good fit, rather than something that is a key revenue piece. Um, but And then there would be additional steps. So to answer your question, um, like I said, I fully believe that there's not going to be a flood of major kids to leave because they can get this for free through a couple of different avenues. But we would, um, you know, set up a more formal application process. We have draft applications and um, a 
agreements with parents that we've um, been working on that are not finalized yet. Um, and then we would actually hope to work with our accrediting agencies in order to have the diploma program accredited because our supplemental accreditation does not transfer over to that automatically. Um, so we'll enter into a kind of mini self-study for this academic year just for the diploma granting program and we'll get feedback from them and then hopefully add that into our accreditation um, as well. So it's our hope that by the end of the academic year it would be an accredited program as well, um, but that's going to be a little bit, um, you know, varied based upon the timeline of the different agencies that we work with. Yeah, Mary, just to point out something, um, we kind of a few years ago benefited sort of in reverse where um, this would have been the 2011 graduation where a, a student who had been homeschooled for a number of years, um, parent felt that actually be good for him to actually be in classroom and have, <coughs> like on his college applications, have input from teachers, not just his mom. So he came in, did quite well, um, with, you know, in our system, and, and we, we take credit that he went to Princeton for it. So, um, but it's this kind of thing where it's a, it's balance of you know, this can work both ways, where you might have some homeschoolers or who've been involved yeah. with that, who might say, well, I do want to go to well, the, then, the and, you know, to be honest with you, one of the reasons that um, we kept the full-time tuition really small for this year is that some of the schools, so some of the schools that we've worked with, the students that we've served full-time, the schools have actually paid for their full-time enrollment because the $4,000 tuition to us is less than the or 7,200 that they would have lost to the charter school. So, so and, and I don't, I think that as a service to member schools that understand our program and our model and are comfortable with the quality of the courses, we would still be very willing to, so you may have a student in Maynard that wants a full-time program and you're happy for them to, you know, work through and continue to accumulate Maynard credits using the HS courses, and that would still be allowed. Um, that's, you know, they're not transferring their transcript and all of their graduation requirements to us. So, I think that that's, um, and that was the kind of the key driver that where schools started to approach us and say, listen, we've got online charter schools now. Like, I'm worried that I'm going to lose my at-risk kids, my homeschool mm -hmm. kids, and they're going to leave our district and go to these um, schools. And I don't think that that has happened to um, the extent that there was the fear about it among some of the public school leaders in the state. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a movement for sure. Yeah. Amy, um are you on a timeline that you need a decision by a certain date to move forward, or? Well, you could just say yes today. <laughs> that, that's a possibility. That's and if a possibility. we don't say yes today, what are the consequences? <laughs> yeah. So, I'm, I'm just kidding. Well, not really. No. Um, so, <laughs> ideally, I have folks that, so because the, um, we need the approval before we can have accreditation conversations with, um, I've had some initial conversations with the director of, Digital Education at um, Advanced Ed, and, and Jeff has had some conversations with the president of um, Middle States about kind of the transition to a, a full-time program accreditation. Um, I expect that that's going to take a while. The accrediting agencies don't really move that fast. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, two times a year that they vote on things, and, you know, we're kind of already too late for their fall commission. So I think um, for us, feedback from Maynard is the sooner the better. Um, it doesn't have to be tonight, but for sure within the next couple of meetings. Um, okay. We have lots of folks that are asking about what the status is, um, and it's just, you know, we're kind of at a wait to see. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I ideally had wanted to have this before the school committee a little bit earlier in the year, but then we had um, hosting two site visits in one year, and I work part-time. That was really hard. Yeah. So. The, the only thing uh, um, difficult that I see moving forward that if we do postpone it tonight, um, two of our members, unfortunately, were not here tonight, so they did not see your presentation. And Amy and I are not going to be on the committee mm -hmm. come July, so we have two new members. Yep. So you're basically back at ground zero with understanding oh, okay. of, right. of that. Well, um, you know, and to be honest with you, so I, um, from my administrative lens of DHS, we, you know, we've enjoyed a very long relationship with Maynard, and, um, and I think that we're extremely happy to be able to present to the school committee, but I feel like there's, um, you know, once the program is established and approved, there's not, um, I don't think that there's an ongoing reportability or accountability perspective. We handle that internally, um, yeah. 
And so I, you know, if you're comfortable providing feedback on the proposal tonight, I don't even know if you can, if you're down to members, um, I would be happy to hear feedback. Um, I don't know where you kind of stand with it. And, you know, we'll, we're very, you know, we're a very partner-focused yeah. organization. So, you know. Uh, question. That's what I'm going to say today. But <laughs> <laughs> question. Uh, obviously, I mean, we could make a decision tonight. We do have a quorum. We're leader of legal. Do you want, though, to postpone? The, the thing I said is that we got a list of, a, we don't have a policy concerning this. I think one of the reasons right. is that just that we're not a large town, either population or area. So the idea of, oh, a school is just going to plop down and, you know, want us to, want to approve, other than the fact that there was a, a building, a school building that Amago moved into mm -hmm. several years ago, we don't really see that, that happening and being virtual, yeah, you could Right. You can be in a in an office, just right. you know, a few people, and that's it. Well, and that's kind of you know, we're thirty six people over in the clock tower, and you know, it's a and you know, and it is a very odd, um, it's a very odd system for. I mean, I understand for large municipalities where you would have space and things, but yeah. um, you know, I don't see it taxing infrastructure in the town at all. Yeah. And, you know, well, that isn't the, the, yeah. the thing. Um, our attorney had had provided essentially like uh, criteria for approval of a private school by a school committee. Some of it is like, okay, the physical plant, safety, that, that kind of thing, which is like, yeah, it's, it's kind of a moot point. Uh, population to be served, you sort of address that. Um, the curriculum, you went through with that. It, about education materials that we've kind of discussed. Um, the school staff, and I'm not sure if, um, what further, you know, you know, approvals or qualifications or whatever that it would be needed here um, for it. Um, Talk about administrations, record keeping, student services, which you did address to some extent about students on uh, IEPs or, or 504s. Um, you know, I asked about the tuition and, and that dealt with the financial support here. Um, I'm not sure if we really got into the student performance assessment or student learning time um, for it, because one of the things that you did kind of address was that, well, you know, some students might take longer because there's sort of circumstance, but we also have policies about part-time students as well. So, you know, it's, I'm not saying that that. Well, and of course, so to hit a few of those. I um, can't see so there's no light. Teachers are licensed instructors, yeah. so all of our teachers have a certificate from their state of employment. Over half of our teachers are Massachusetts teachers, um, so we use only highly qualified teachers in the content area of their um, field of expertise. All of our curriculum staff are licensed. Which other I private schools a, don't have to do it. I don't think other private no, schools, private schools have to. don't have to, but we do because we serve yeah. mainly public schools. Okay, um, that's good. I have a superintendent's license with the state, um, and you know we have business and you know all the financial things. Right. It could be late. Um, <laughs> and in terms of the seat time, learning time requirements, um, so our courses were built more on a Carnegie unit system mm -hmm. than on a competency system. Um, and so our courses, we were developed by teachers that expected a certain seat time per um, week for different courses of levels. So we have a standard honors and AP level. And so what we do is we have six to eight hours, eight to 10, 10 to 12 hours per week of time. And that data is tracked through student output. Um, we can track it in the learning management system to a degree, although a lot of the work that they do is external. We use that to track access and attendance and um, keep students accountable to the you know, minimum login times per week. Um, but we also grab student feedback from um, the student surveys and any of the um, individual course feedback that they give the teacher in terms of time on learning. And we found that it's fairly, um, it's fairly consistent with what the time that the teachers have established has been um, year over year, so. Yeah, I mean, the other concern that we had, which I think we did get an answer from our attorney, was, was concern about how Money from the federal government for for special needs students get divvied up based on other schools in your area. I think that that has yeah. been addressed. And is is, is, is is we got to I guess the best answer that we're going to get right. on it, which actually was sort of uh, really, alleviate our concerns mm -hmm. on that. But I guess really the question is, is that do you want to postpone or do you want to vote tonight? I mean, so well, here's my question. I know Bob had said having a policy would be helpful, but it, it does seem like this is a bit of an outlier. Yeah. And, and it seems like we're not going to have, we're, 
we're not going to be the new hottest location for more private schools <laughs> for the reasons Bill enumerated. And, and, the, and the policy would basically be hitting these criteria that Andy provided right. us anyway. Right. That Andy provided, right? And and I think Amy's responded to all of those. Yeah. And I mean, you also have to go through another accreditation process. I mean, we're just the first step. We're not the last step. So, I mean. You know, I think I think what we kind of have to do is to say we don't have any legal concerns. We don't have concerns about violation of policy. A lot of things seem to be in place. It seems like a lot of the other stuff that needs to fall into place is all on someone else's agenda. So I, I don't actually see, unless I'm missing something, I don't see any concerns that would say we need, the only reason to bump it to the new school committee would be for them to have time to think about it or pursue something or unearth something right. that might be of concern. I don't see anything necessarily to worry about. Do you? I'm wondering, what, what does Principal Karajina say about this? Does he, has he weighed in? He all? hasn't. But um, I know that um, he knows the history we've had with virtual high school, with Sandy LeBlanc and her work with virtual high school. Um, he thinks the world of, of what she's doing. And he must work courses. with them frequently. And he works, and we do have approximately 50 students u utilizing their skills, their courses, and he approves of that, so. And many of them take, um, if I yeah. recall right from, from Anna, in an area um, in the, where the administrative offices are. So he sees the students yeah. taking the classes. You know, as if well. we don't offer French 4, they get it through virtual high school, you know, with those outlier courses that we can't offer. So. I think he would be in support of it, I, and after getting the attorney's um, deliberation right. on some of those other concerns, I feel comfortable supporting it. So if you feel comfortable supporting it tonight, I think it should go forward. Do, is there any reason you But as a teacher, kind of as a teacher, it's what do you think? It's hard, yeah, I think it's... I know I mean, you have a teacher perspective. I think that's where, if I'm, if I'm feeling reservation, I think it's from that. It's funny, as so you were talking, well, because I, I think, Amy, you did a I'm fabulous... <laughs> No, you did it. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, yeah, no, it's all good. No, I think you did a fabulous. It was funny as you were as you were presenting. Every question I wrote down before I had a chance to ask, most of them you were answering. Yeah. So one of my concerns is I'm a high school English teacher, yeah. and so I'm thinking about literature discussion. What does this look like? And trying to imagine, because I know you said open ended discussions. Because I'm thinking about empathy and cultural competency, and I love <laughs> the idea that yeah. I mean I teach in a private high school. Um, and part of the problem is it's a bubble. And so when you're trying to have conversations about race. Um, so, you know, it's funny. It's, I mean, we've been using more tools. We're actually investigating requiring synchronous elements in the courses. Um, yeah. We're piloting it in some courses now. Um, finding the right tool. Um, enrollment is cross time zones for most courses. So it's very hard to say, okay, 9 o'clock every Tuesday, everybody's yeah. going to be there. Um, teachers use these voice boards in the courses. Um, the, the prompts that they start discussions with are, generally speaking, the 30,000 foot view, and they yeah. give kids, so, you know, in a, um, in a, the environmental science course, they look at um, the influence of bioengineering on, you know, eliminating sickness and age and how that does, you know, population diversity and density. So they have to form the opinion, they have to talk about the opinion, and they have to justify their opinions with them. Um, our, English curriculum coordinator should be always can't think of any great English things. But you know, they they have a great Tickle Mockingbird course, um, which is all about racial diversity and you know, and the kids come out of that class, you know, the class is set up and, and I'm happy to, you know, um, show you through some of that at some point. Um, hopefully after you go to say that's my professor. Um, they you know, they go through, they'll do peer editing of work. So they work in wikis to do peer editing. Um, students lead discussions sometimes during different weeks of the courses. There's a lot of different tools that they use for collaboration. Um, as I said, our teachers are really trained to pull things out of kids. So they don't accept good job, great work, I agree, as answers. Um, there's lots of expectations set up in the front end of the course around word count and you know ways that they communicate with each other. Is there, um, is there live, so I'm just thinking of a tense moment in class where a student might say something hurtful mm -hmm. to another student, and it's face to face. And part of the learning, I think, is when the student who said the hurtful thing has to see the hurt in the other student's face. And does that is that happening so with that? That actually happens sometimes. I mean, we have students that disagree for sure. Yeah. Um, it's not live. It's not live. They, but I don't think that that makes it less valuable. I mean, I think it makes it different. But I don't necessarily think that it makes it less valuable for for the kids. We've had so there are private. 
small groups of kids. Every student has a private discussion topic for themselves and their teacher. Um, and then they have class discussion boards and they have collaborative um, areas. So I think in the class discussion boards, very often there will be um, varied perspectives on, you know, um, there are students that are, you know, coming out from different, you know, lifestyles that they'll talk through those things in their class. Or they'll come up and as I look through discussion boards, you know, quite often I'll follow a trail of discussion go to one of the students' private friends and realize that the teacher has engaged that kid in a whole conversation about how they're approaching what, what they're doing in class. So, so our students are, are taught to be sensitive, I think, in a written word, which is um, important, too, from the way that communication is kind of trending in the 21st century. So, you know, in, in a, in a full-time environment, I think that's why we're um, working really hard to establish um, at least monthly opportunities for kids to have that face-to-face -face engagement. Like I said, for this first couple of years, I expect enrollment to be pretty small. I think that it'll be a, a real small community of kids that can get to know each other fairly deeply. Mm -hmm. um, and we just have to shape it based upon student interest once they're enrolled in the program. So, so I, you know, it's, um, I know that we have lots of teachers that tell us that their familiarity with their students and their online courses is as good or deeper than their because you have the opportunity, kids share a lot, I mean, about themselves and their personal lives, and, and you have, there's a safety in kind of the discussion board environment for them sometimes, where they are able to unburden things that they don't necessarily um, share in a face-to-face -face setting. Um, we have lots of, you know, language arts teachers that have found really, we do a lot with um, self-selected works for students so they can pick something that's meaningful to them, we have a young adult literature course that's really thematic, so they look at issues of um, gender and they look at issues of, um, they do a unit on um, gender equality and they do a unit on, there's four themes, um, and so they do a lot of short story reading and writing and talking about it, and then they pick a novel that's in the theme and then they share that with the class. So it's, um, it's, it's very high quality. And, it, and like I said, it's uh, until you've kind of been in it, I guess it's probably hard to imagine, but um, if I had some of my students that were here to tell you, it, it, it's, it's as good as what happens. I mean, in a different way, but it's as, as it can be as quality as what happens in the first class. So if we approve, if this passes and you guys get accreditation, a kid could graduate having done all online education, but they get a Maynard diploma. Right? No, oh, no, no. 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 The, it's not is, at all? They no, won't get, it's not linked to Maynard at all. Okay. So they would get a, a diploma from you. Academy okay. Diploma. okay. We have to get your approval, but once we get your approval, we're not affiliated with the Maynard Public School. We're sort of done. Way. We're just their first it's stepping weird. stone. The state just requires us to make sure that. I think that, that the state doesn't have infrastructure to evaluate private schools. I, I don't know. Right. I don't understand. The, I'm sure there's some. <laughs> I'm sure there's some reason or rationale that the state it, didn't have an approval process, but they put it on. Yeah, the many committees. states do. They have a Department of Ed, you know, kind of oversight okay. oversight of at least the initial private school approval. But so I, I guess I was confused because with the financial piece, so the four thousand tuition that has been charged for a full time student. Mm -hmm. You said in some instances that's been good for a school because say they're right. getting sixty seven hundred from the state per pupil, they're paying out four thousand. But they don't have to. It could be the parents. But it it it, it, could it be. basically from a another district yeah. can say is oh that student can go to the virtual charter school and we lose a lot of money, yeah. or we can willingly pay for that student to go here and reduce the loss. Right. And that's been the past two years only. So when the Commonwealth Virtual Schools Act was passed a couple yeah. of years ago, um, and that established the Mass Virtual Academy on Greenfield, um, that was when we first had communications with school leaders that said, long time member, you've got to help me out here. Like, I don't want to have. And, and a lot of the reasons, because some of those schools were risky schools for um, loss to an online academy, because they were using our program for so that was, that doesn't necessarily go away as a service
you know, the special ed piece, and I was saying to Bob, I, I think that that's a, a residency requirement, like a district residency requirement, and I can certainly find that out, but I don't think that there would be, our intention is not to ask me. Or well, to usually the privates don't because services. the problem is the federal government requires so much paperwork for you to do it. Right. That's a pain in the neck. So even a Monaco, they don't ask for it. Because right. it's such a pain. That, just what we have to do to get the money is right. paying the neck for us. Yeah, our intention is So the privates tend not to. Now. So, you know, it is what it is. But yeah. I, th I think it's just the, the difficulty that we may have sort of an issue to digest everything is that mm -hmm. we view you as, I think the way you phrased it, was a supplemental role that you provide to mm -hmm. multiple schools. Um, but now it's like, okay, you just want to be solely, not, not solely, but you want to have the ability to be solely focused on student as a full-time possibly going through the four years of your school and graduate and that's really just the difference that they haven't been doing before and to basically we have to kind of approve it give us give them our blessing and then they progress on with the accreditation and the other yeah. process on it it and seems to me the accreditation process is you know the relationships with the tutoring service and the special ed service and all of those things that i've alluded to with companies, those have to be nailed down and official. I need contracts for services, you know, for those students before. So our accreditation will um, dot I's and cross T's of every, you know, any of the ambiguity that um, you may feel in terms of how we're supporting those students from the, where we're differentiating from our traditional kind of background. I mean, it seems to me that the type of population you're talking about is really fairly small and specialized and so I have a hard time imagining a lot of students even wanting to do it and it, it seems that because you know like how social kids are and the importance of that social even for kids maybe who are real terrible introverts and not entirely I mean they still even that's a big step to to make right. so it seems like I would think as such a small population that it's not really I mean you're, it's just going to be a real niche environment it definitely um, is and I think, you know, there's a, um, we get occasional requests from international students um, that seek to get for a diploma, and that may or may not be an um, area of interest for some students as well. But aside from, but those aren't students that are U.S. residents anyhow, so that's a different, um, but aside from that, it is for sure a very small population of kids that are um, intended to. I, I do think, you know, there are certain students who maybe suffer from anxiety who would say, oh gosh, here's this great chance, I don't have to go to school. And I, I wonder, it might feel safer, but is that what's best for those students too, that they don't have to now try to get over that fear and yeah. to engage with that? I, I well, it, it's a, it's a two-edged sword in a sense because you also then have situations where um, students who may be bullied or, you know, or subject to that kind of, Thing. not just having the anxiety but actually having physical threats or verbal threats against them who really can't feel don't feel safe in their school and this provides them an opportunity as yeah, well I also, I also think in that instance then it's a community problem and you want to fix the community instead of just taking that kid out and letting that continue i don't know because so, might be another target right I yeah mean, but i mean i yeah. think I, you know for a kid who has anxiety and asking the question is that the best for the kid to do an entirely online environment. I think that's absolutely the right question to ask. I just don't know if sitting here and saying no were the people to answer that question. It yeah. seems that that sh really, it starts with the kid and the parents um, and possibly extends to the support structures within whatever brick and mortar school they happen to be in. Um, and, you know, I trust that they'll make enough of the right decisions that we shouldn't say no because. You know, you think of the kids going to Nepal. Well, isn't it great to be able to support that kind of missionary work? Or kids who are on immunosuppressant drugs. Isn't it great that they're able to continue academic engagement while they're undergoing severe medical treatment? Um, or children who have the opportunity to train for the Olympics yeah. um, and need to continue their studies because that's what they want to do. You know, I think in any system, you're going to have people at the edges where you're like, is that really a good idea? I don't know if that'd be my choice. Um, but, you know, I think we have to allow for some people to either make some mistakes or for people to have a different decision than what we might think might be in their best interest and 
trust that overall the bulk of the kids are there for some very valid reasons that meet very niche needs um, and that the kids at the edge that stuff will sort of get worked out and that's my thinking well and I think too um, part of it is and I I realized that we met an hour ago so but I think part of it is also placing a fair amount of faith and, or trust in organizational capacity to work for what's in the best interest of students you know we're not um, we for a long time I move to approve the do we accept or approve the application from virtual high school to continue on their path towards approving an online academy for full time high school. For full time high school. I think that covered it, right? Second. Well, I'll, second. I'll second. It. I'll second it. I'll second it. I'll second it. Is there any any comments from the rest of the audience? Congratulations. <laughs> I'm sorry to be the naysayer. <laughs> no, it's okay. And Mary, uh, Bob, uh, ask Bob someday for the his, these uh, four years of conversation he and I have had about online. When he's like, well, we don't have to have that course. We have it online. And I'm like, well, <laughs> but I don't know. So yeah. uh, we've been going round and round on it. And I've been saying a lot of the same things that, that you've said here today. So I appreciate it. And I promise you. <laughs> we'll find out where you live if there's that in the beacon next week. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item. Um, policy second reading. It's the school committee bylaws. It's actually the, for the second vote. Um, sent out the updated that we had uh, amended. Basically, same as four, except, let me just go through here a second. Um, <clears throat> We added that the school committee member can also comment on old business and to raise potential um, uh, future uh, school committee agenda items. And we clarified the um, citizens comments to the number of minutes for each individual presentation and the total amount of uh, minutes for citizens comments and also to clarify that they can uh, comment on the agenda items listed uh, at discretion of the chairman of the meeting. And I believe that was the only update. So if I could have a motion on. I move to approve school committee policy number 102 with the changes noted. Okay. Can I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor? Thank you. All right. The other part of the policy uh, was just really an update on. A to-do list for for Mary <laughs> <laughs> and Jamal and whoever else is, is on, the, <laughs> on the um, school committee. Obviously, it lists the uh, high school attendance uh, that we discussed uh, last last meeting. But for the, the student handbook, um, also we, we need to have a foreign exchange students policy um, that should be worked over uh, the summer. 
Um, next, the rest are the listing of the policies that will be three years old as we go through the course of the year. So these are probably just doing the, these orders sort of the time frame. But also we need to update the administrative regulation for homework. We updated the policy in March, but we asked to have feedback about the homework uh, administrative regulations. Basically each uh, Green Meadow, Fowler, and high school saying how many minutes of homework should be done for each grade level or you know, in getting high school, like so many you know, minutes each night in you know, different subjects and whatnot. And also we need administrative regulations on 250, which is borrowing of school equipment. The policy, the, the policy references a administrative regulation and we don't have one. Okay. And the same thing with duplication of material. We, we listed one, but I've never been able to find you know, what we had listed for that. And I mean, that's, it's been several years um, that we've had not had the administrative regulation for that. But it also, again, it references that the superintendent will have that uh, for it. So that those are the, the to-do list for, for next year. Yeah, I just want to say though, the fact that the oldest policy is three years old is a testament to a lot of work. We got through a lot this, this summer. So I think probably the thing to go in future is maybe don't have any like five years mm -hmm. or older and uh, I mean, wanted to really try to make, make get caught up this year so that we leave you in good stead. Um, but it's the kind of thing where we did so much this year, I don't expect you to, you know, three years from now, have that same pace. Yeah. So some of them can, can stretch out for a few years, but at least we were, were pretty well caught up. So next thing on the agenda, citizen comments? Nothing. Okay. Uh, members, uh, comments or questions? Thank you for the bamboo. Yes, thank and you. And the cards. Very thoughtful. Much appreciated. <sighs> You're done. Yeah, almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> almost. Not 20, not 20. 19. 19. 19. 19. Same. One I don't second. get the gold watch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get the gold watch. You don't need one. You've got one. <laughs> my, what, my Swiss Army one that my brother gave me that was a, uh, in his pack of gifts to doctors when he was a pharmaceutical sales rep. They gave out Swiss Army watches? They yeah. used to give out good stuff. They used to yeah, <laughs> give out really good stuff. And that, that's what we got for Christmas from him. No wonder why drugs are so expensive. Yeah. Oh, definitely. yeah. You should see all the Although, books we have and stuff. Well, my brother's a, a drug pharmacy rep, and the parties he goes to, I can tell you, I'm like, and your drugs cost how much? Can you, you just went to a party in Bermuda? <laughs> and I'm <Yeah>. not kidding. <laughs> all right. So, the last things, and we have no more questions, we do have executive session. So, I will pull the committee to go into executive session according to Mass General Law C30A, Section 21 2 to return to open session. I approve. Approve, approve. So. Well, we're returning to open session uh -huh. to publicly declare decisions on the contract? Yes. Okay. I think that's the way it has to be done. Okay, will well, anybody other than Bob be here? <laughs> Probably not, but the way it does, unless you want to stick around. I think we're good. Okay, okay good. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you well, I'll for turn coming. Off. I'll turn off. Yeah, you're, you're yeah, fine yeah. there, Mayor. <laughs> well, call the meeting back to order. Um, what we're reporting is that uh, per the uh, superintendent's contract, we are extending his contract for one year and increasing his salary by 4.5%, uh, which will raise the salary to one thousand, excuse me, $178,000. So, congratulations, Thank Bob. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And so now, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thanks Good night. For an excellent year. Goodbye.